Sorry, just lost a crucial piece of paper. Thank you, Sylvia, for bringing us our Bible readings today. If you want to reopen your Bible or flick a few pages back to Ephesians chapter 3, what we had in our Galatians reading there, we'll pick up on uh, particularly the fact that we can call God our Father and how we are all one in Christ. But do open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 3 on page 1174. And before we get started too far, I've got a question for you. Well, three, in fact. And the answer to my questions is either more or less. Okay? Now, this went wrong in Dale Abbey. <laughs> but you've only got two answers, more or less. Here we go. Does hand washing your dishes, on average, use more or less water than a dishwasher? Very confident over here. More. It's more, apparently, yeah. A recent study found that hand washing uses around three and a half times more water than a modern day dishwasher. There we go. Um, all right, next question. Are more or less sausages eaten in the UK every day than eggs? More or less. Elaine was very confident in it's more. <laughs> no, it's less, Elaine, yeah. Around 5 million sausages are eaten every day compared to a whopping 36 million eggs. We were sausages. You enjoy them, Elaine. <laughs> Great. Oh, we had eggs yesterday. And you had eggs? Great. Um, I didn't have you both in specific mind for that stat, but there we go. Right, more or less. Does Egypt have... Go on, Sydney. Are you recording? I am recording. Thank you very much. <laughs> Fantastic. Yes. Well done. Thanks very much. Does Egypt have more or less pyramids? Than Sudan. Less. Yes. Sudan has more pyramids than Egypt, with around 255 known pyramids. Now, you're not in the wrong place. You have come to church. Don't worry. Why are we playing more or less? It's because when it comes to grasping the scale of God's love, it is always more than we think. Okay, it's always more than we think, and that's what we're going to see today. And it's really important that we see it, because maybe you're sitting here today, or watching online later, thinking that you are unlovable or unlovely. Or perhaps some of us are tempted to feel that we're beyond the reach of God's love, that our background is too immoral, or too poor, or too privileged, or too idolatrous, or too dysfunctional for us to be genuinely loved by Jesus. Or maybe you're tempted to follow the line of argument from people like Richard Dawkins or Stephen Fry, who say that God is some kind of distant, cruel monster, disinterested in you. Or maybe you're a Christian sitting here this morning, who's just feeling lukewarm about things. Let this passage in Ephesians chapter 3 be an encouragement to you and a challenge to the lie that you are too unlovely or that God is distant and cruel and disinterested. So let's pray to that end. Father God, uh, there's so many things in our lives that crowd around us that try to take us away from you and your love. Please help us today as we look at this passage in Ephesians to both know and grasp uh, more of your love for us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So if you were here last week, James was preaching for us on Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 to 13. And if you look back to Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1, we see that Paul starts it like this. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, and then there's a hyphen, because Paul, it's almost as if he remembers something else that he wants to say about this mystery of the gospel, that Jews and Gentiles alike can be united together, sharers of the one body, together in the promise of Christ Jesus. That's what it says in verse 6 of chapter 3. He wants to say more of that. And then we get to our passage today where Paul gets back to what he was going to say. So if you look at chapter 3, verse 14, he goes back to it. For this reason. So, in other words, because Jews and Gentiles are both saved through the Lord 
through the Lord Jesus, this is what Paul does. And the first thing we see is that he prays to the Father. So look at verse 14 and 15. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. What a privilege that Jesus prays to his Father, and we can do the same thing, because we have a heavenly Father. Do you remember that in at the Galatians reading that Sylvia read to us? It talks about the fact that we're adopted to sonship. We can call God Abba, Father. And it's dead easy to forget how stunning it is that we can call the supreme being, the creator of the universe, the governor of all things, Father. The Arabic word, Abba, which Jesus used, doesn't refer to the band which has just released a new single. It means Father, and it's both affectionate and respectful. Never before in the history of human religion, even in the Jewish faith, did a teacher ever dare to call God Father? But that's what we can do now as Christians. Jesus knew that the first principle of prayer and kind of the rocket engine that drives us to pray isn't technique, but is theology. Understanding not how to pray, but who we pray to. We pray to our Father. And if you remember, back to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5, in love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. God's people have been chosen to be adopted so that we can call God our Father. And remember, there was no arm twisting for that. It's according to God's pleasure and will. He wanted to do it from before time began. And as adopted children, we are entitled to speak to our Father in the name of his Son, by the power of his Spirit. And the thing is, you see, our Father loves us passionately and perfectly. Unlike human fathers, he's always available. He's never distracted by his phone. He always knows what's best for us to be, uh, to be more like Jesus. He's always patient and kind. He's always available to provide whatever is necessary. He's generous but wise, firm in discipline but quick to forgive. He never breaks a promise and he goes with us everywhere. He's truly the best father anyone could want, especially for those who've had ab absent or dreadful human fathers. And notice too, just as a little aside, how we see the Trinity at work here. It's brilliant. Have a look at verse 14 again. For this reason, I, Paul, kneel before the Father, so that's God the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit, the Spirit of God the Father, the Holy Spirit, in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Isn't it brilliant? And again, just as an aside, I'm hoping that in Lent, running up to Easter next year, we can have a mini-series on the Trinity and what that means for us as God's people and the difference that it makes. But we have Paul praying to the Father that we as his people would be strengthened with power through his Spirit. So look at verse 16 again. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. What a great thing to pray. If you were here when we looked at Ephesians chapter 1, verses 19 and 20, that's the same power that raised the Lord Jesus from the dead. It's not a weak power, it's extremely powerful. And Paul wants the Ephesian believers to be strengthened with that power through the Holy Spirit, so that Christ would dwell in their hearts through faith. And this isn't a hard thing. Because God does it out of, the out of his glorious riches. Now, a person in whom the Spirit is working powerfully is someone who will be changing deeply. Because when the Spirit of Christ makes himself at home, this was picked up in our first hymn, uh, Love Divine, he constantly renovates our hearts to make us a more appropriate dwelling for the Lord Jesus. Because the Lord Jesus isn't just dropping in for a cuppa. 
He makes his home with us forever. So, I don't know if you've recently been to a hotel for an overnight stay, just like a one night thing. If you do that, you probably just leave your stuff in your suitcase rather than taking it all out. But when someone moves into a new home permanently, they might change the wallpaper, they might paint the ceiling, they might replace the carpet and they'll get rid of the old furniture. When the Spirit of Christ moves in, he gradually redecorates everywhere. Room by room, the horrible old wallpapers of selfishness are replaced with a brand new wallpaper called love. The old ceilings, darkened by fear of death, are repainted with bright colours of hope in the resurrection of Christ. Filthy old carpets, stained by years of immorality, are replaced with clean new carpets of purity and kindness. And the rickety old furniture of idolatry is gradually replaced with sparkling new ministries that worship Jesus. Now, I'm not so good at writing things like that, so I've obviously borrowed that paragraph. But isn't it powerful? It's great. The question is, will we pray, like Paul, for the power of God's Spirit to welcome Christ, to renovate our hearts as we surrender our heart and lives to, have, to his transforming words of Scripture? It's a great thing and a big thing to pray. But next... Paul prays that being strengthened by the Spirit, we would be rooted and established in love. I'm going to read verse 16 and 17 again. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, we'll get to verse 18 in a moment. Paul prays that the Ephesians will be rooted and established in he wants them, in other words, to be like trees. Our lives are to send down roots deep and wide into the soil of love. If we're properly rooted and properly constructed on a foundation of love, nothing will be able to shake us. Do you remember back in the summer, those of you with us uh, week on week, we looked at the fruits of the Spirit. And the first fruit of the Spirit is... Oh, the lacking of confidence there. <laughs> yes, it is. It's love. First fruit of the Spirit is love. And one commentator puts it like this, okay? Love is the key. Joy is love singing. Okay, whoever is singing, <laughs> still joy is love singing. Peace is love resting. Long-suffering or patience is love enduring. Kindness is love's touch. Goodness is love's character. Faithfulness is love's habit. Gentleness is love's self-forgetfulness. Self-control is love holding the reins. There's no fruits of the Spirit without love. I, I wish I found that quote for the summer. <laughs> it would have been really helpful. But then look what Paul prays in verse 18. Okay, and this is where we get to the, the crunch of what we're thinking about today. Paul prays to the Father that we would be strengthened by his Spirit to be rooted and established in love so that, there's a purpose to it, we might grasp and know God's love. Let's look at verse 18. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, verse 18, may have power, together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. Now just note, this grasping and knowing of God's love, it's not something you can do on your own. Like this is why God loves the church, because we need to be together with all of God, all the Lord's people, to be able to grasp the scale of God's love for us. It's not something you can do on your own. That's why Christians need to be part of a church. We need to be together. Now, there's four dimensions to this love, isn't there? And they blow away the lie that God is distant, that he's a cruel monster, that he's disinterested, that you are too unlovely. So let's dwell on these four things, okay? Firstly, let's look at the width of God's love. Why? God's love is so wide, it shows how accepting he is. Paul has already celebrated how the love of Christ embraces Jew and Gentile, and anyone from any background who comes to him for mercy. That's Ephesians chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. We need God's help to grasp how wide the love of Christ is. 
If you are trusting Christ, there is nothing you have done or could ever do that would put you outside of his embrace. Nothing. He's a, this is a wide and accepting love. That's why it's so helpful we're saying that our God is a great big God. His love is wider. Now let's think about how long it is. This illustrates how long lasting God's love is. Paul has already celebrated the eternity of God's love from before the foundation of the world when you were chosen to be his child. Remember back to Ephesians 1 verses 4 and 5. Perhaps some of us have been painfully abandoned in the past by someone who promised to love us. A father, a husband, a girlfriend. The world is full of people who will say, I love you, but who don't mean it. Or perhaps we worry that he might give up on us because we're just not changing enough and we suspect he'll get fed up with our constant failures. We need to grasp that God's love for us is permanent. However badly or however often we disappoint him, he will never let us go. He's committed to love us from eternity past, for eternity everlasting and forever and forever and forever and forever. He'll never give up. His love is long. Or what about high? Paul has also celebrated how the love of God in Christ doesn't simply save us, but lifts us high into heaven so that we're seated in the heavenly realms with Christ. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7 tell us that. Perhaps sometimes you wonder whether it's really worth being a Christian and whether Christ really has much to offer or whether the benefits will outweigh the costs. We need to grasp how high is the love of Christ, how much he has in store for us in eternity, and how exalted and privileged we will be forever in the new creation. Christ's love has lifted us from the gutter to his palace, from hell to heaven. His is a high love. But it's also deep. Deep illustrates how sacrificial Christ's love is for us. We've also already seen in Ephesians chapter 1 how Christ sacrificed himself for us on the cross. I wonder, have you ever really considered the depths of the agony of Christ in suffering not only the physical uh, torture of beatings and crucifixion and the public humiliation of being strung up and uh, strung up naked uh, as a criminal to be mocked and abused, but also the spiritual trauma of his own soul the hell, as he took on himself the hell that each one of us deserved. Have you stopped recently to realise that he accepted such depths of agony out of personal love for you. Perhaps some of us think the things we've done or repeatedly done in the office or on the internet or in our imagination are too terrible to be forgiven. We need to grasp that Jesus Christ not only knows the filthy things that we've done and the far more numerous kind things that we failed to do, but that he willingly accepted deep into his soul all the punishments that we deserve. His is an incredibly deep, sacrificial love. And when we get our head around those four things, Paul then prays that we might know what can't be fully known. Do you see that in verse 19? Have a look at verse 19. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge. What an amazing verse, what amazing things to be getting our heads around. To know what the pastor's knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. So I think there's an invitation for each one of us this morning, which is this. Will you ask the Father, by his Spirit, to help you know and grasp the love of Christ? Will you ask the Father that? It's a great thing to ask, isn't it? I'm going to tell you a story to help illustrate this. And this is uh, from a guy uh, called Richard Cokin, who's written a commentary on the book of Ephesians, which I found really helpful. I wonder, have you ever heard of Bombardier Robert Key? 
who died in World War II when a grenade he was holding exploded. An army report blamed him for showing off with the grenade in the recaptured French town of Anazin in September 1944. And because of that, his family were apparently ashamed because his service record cited foolish behaviour for his death. And so they refused to talk about him for 65 years. But when the mayor of Anazin traced Robert's family in Coventry in 2008 to ask permission for a ne to name a road after Robert, the truth began to emerge. The family discovered that Robert had in fact snatched a grenade from a large group of children he'd found playing with it. When one boy pulled out the pin, Bombardier Key seized the grenade and fled away, clutching the grenade to his stomach to protect the children when it exploded. To this day, Robert remains a legend in the town of Anazin. Robert's nephew, also called Robert, said, this news was amazing and completely different to anything we'd known. For unbelievers, and to some degree believers, the sheer scale of the love of Christ is completely different to anything we've known. So, we're going to have a moment now for you to consider one of these two questions. And it might be a bit small, I might try and make it bigger. Okay, the questions are this. Reflect on a time when you struggled as a Christian or repeatedly gave in to a particular sin. How was that connected with a failure to grasp Christ's love for you? You could think about that. Or you could think about wide, long, high and deep. Which aspect of Christ's love particularly thrills you today? I'll just make them a tad bigger and then I'll have just a few moments of quiet to think, think about that. <coughs> I think it'd be really worth spending more time thinking about those questions, dwelling on those dimensions of God's love for us. Now, we began, didn't we, this morning, thinking about more or less, more or less. Please, when you go out today, it's so important that each one of us grasps that when it comes to Jesus' love, it's always more than we think. It's always more than we think. That means we can pray, verse 20 and 21, which I'm going to do just now. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. <coughs> Great. Our next uh, hymn is Blessed Assurance. This is my story, this is my song. The story of God's love for us, bigger than we think. Um, this is one that Jono and Becky put together for us during lockdown. I'm not sure we've sung it together congregationally. Um, so if it doesn't work, uh, forgive me, but it's worth a try because the words are so encouraging. There's a slightly new bit added on at the end, but let's stand and encourage each other as we sing together, uh, Blessed Assurance. Blessed Assurance. 